good morning, Felicity. How are you? Hi, Leslie. I'm very well. Thank you for asking. And um, are you well? I'm good. Thank you. Good. So this morning I'm joined um, for Pure Talks on um, our Pure Life channel with by Felicity Renwood. And we were just chatting about how Felicity would describe herself because I've met her as a musician but she has a like all of us we have a long journey that gets us to where we are today so well-being and music is what we decided on wasn't it well-being and yes. music mm. and we're just going to talk a bit about Felicity's background and how she got to where she is today and then we're going to touch on subjects like collaboration marketing pricing holistic how our well-being is so important within our practice so we're just going to talk through those you know chat about that just have one of our lovely chats and see where it takes us that sounds good and what can I just pick you up on one thing Leslie yeah there's a I love the daddy jing and there's a there's a saying there it says to define it is to limit it yeah and when you say how would I define myself that's a problem because we're women we're mothers yeah. We're homemakers. We're naturally aware of so many stuff. So how do we define, you know, I've, I've often struggled if I'm teaching the cello, but I've also got a lot of training in health and well-being. Um, starting out as a dentist and going further up that line, working with special needs patients of all sorts of categories. Um, and then evolving into being asked to teach and play music professionally. And then if I'm in a music lesson and, and there's obviously a health issue, but I'm being paid to teach music. I'm thinking, I, for years I had this problem. No, I'm, I'm being a music teacher here, or I'm being a homeopath here, or a dentist here. But actually, the point is, everything interlinks and weaves like a tapestry. Um, so I, I think to define ourselves is, I, at the moment, have an issue with that. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Because that's what society wants to do a lot, doesn't it? It wants to put a label on it. And, you know, I'm very much in the same mindset as you. I mean, don't put a label on me because I have got many hats. And actually, I think the value that I bring to every client I interact with, whatever they come to me for, is because I'm so multi-layered and there's yeah. so many different facets to me. So I absolutely agree. Um, so I feel we're like rich tapestry. Yeah, yeah I like that. So, so I am talking to Felicity point. today. She is a rich tapestry. <laughs> Thank you. There she is. Rich tapestry. <laughs> and I can see you're, you're, we're all rich tapestry. I'm right? a rich tapestry too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you, you alluded, alluded to this tapestry and where it all kind of began with dentistry and music and everything. So give us a bit of background on you. Where did it kind of all, well, where, where I, were you I'm, born? Where did it all start? Uh, okay. Well, I'm from Sheffield originally. Um, my mum was from Cambridge and my dad was from Oldham. They were both uh, surgeons, they were both doctors. They were both what I call cold face medics. My dad did bones and my mum did trauma. And, wow. and so growing up, you didn't get a lot of sympathy if you hurt yourself because they were used to real, you know, extreme trauma. But I'm one of eight kids, so, you know, um, you were brought up, I was brought up very much as part of a crowd, I suppose. Um, a but cat. for me, I, I and and even getting taken on ward rounds with my dad, you know, at Christmas and Easter, little kids, they're nice for the old people in the stuck in hospital, and uh, you know, so I started off doing little doing ward rounds in the hospital with my father as a tiny little tot, I suppose, and I loved going and talking to g generally older people in stuck in a hospital bed. So I've always enjoyed people's stories and their history. I've always found that really fascinating. So social history was one of my favourite subjects for O-level. Um, but I got, I got uh, asked, to, you know, at school I went to, there was a good music service in Sheffield, which was great. And in my last year of junior school, basically they said, does anyone want to learn the cello? So my little hand went up. And my parents were quite musical, but there was a lot of busyness around big family and jobs and work. And, um but my mum had recently started playing her flute again. So music was sort of coming back into the house. And and I got this cello, um, you know, just before I went back to school in September for my last year of junior school, I, I, got, I got my first cello. And this lovely lady who was a bit like my granny, she was from, East, from sort of German background. She was just lovely. Um, and I always remember her saying, 
I'd got webbed, she thought I had webbed hands and I wouldn't make a cellist, but my joke is I took to it like a duck to water. Um, And within a year I was in the the youth orchestra, Sheffield Youth Orchestra. So I just couldn't put this, I think it gave me a voice, being one of eight children and very much a middle, middle, middle child and quite a quiet, helpful, sensitive kid. I think this, this cello gave me a voice. Gave you, um, gave, do you think it gave you, because, you know, you think from being taken out and talking to people from a very young age, you would be very outgoing and confident because you haven't had to sit quietly in the corner like most of us and, um, you know, be seen and not heard. Um, you've been given a chance to go out, but actually maybe not. Maybe. I no, I think, I think there was a lot, you know, there was still a lot of not being treated as an individual, being very much herded with the mass. I'd be, I'm someone who gets very involved with things I'm doing, if it's something creative or reading a book or something. And I remember as a child being disrupted and because we all had to go somewhere. There was very, there was a lot of having to be herded on mass. And yeah, if you didn't go to sleep at night, you know, you've got a good old thrashing and things. Wow, so, yeah. Um, but we we did have a massive woods behind us and a big garden and we would spend the summers just outdoors and mm. you know my parents loved growing veg and I just remember loving the summers and all this freedom outside. Mm. Um, so mm. no, I think for me there there was and I think you know that that time I'm born 1965, you know our parents had my dad had been a medic in the RAF in the war and my mum had grown up in the war and I think. I don't know. I think times had been tough for them, and I, I don't think. I think it was. I think we were still living with the aftermath of that mm. of two world wars mm. in the nineteen sixties. Um, yeah, the, tra- so I think, the trauma. I think it was quite a strict upbringing, and there was a big expectation academically. And yeah. I, I'm quite. I don't spell very well. Typical creative. Um, I love to read, but I'm not a great speller. So, you know, a lot of pressure because I do badly in spelling tests. It's great numbers. Uh, it's probably why isn't I like. It, yeah, uh, isn't it rock. funny that why didn't they know that the bad spellers were the creatives? No, and they, they didn't you know, know that then, did they? And I think still our system, our education system, is so geared to left brain logic thinkers, mm. or or in my case, you know, I always had to suppress my creativity in order to do the academic stuff, mm. and I, I just. You know, my, my heart would have been going down the music trail, but the expectation was to become a doctor. So yeah. in the end... Yeah. Did I, all your siblings go down that doctor route? No, only one. One of my older sisters did medicine. Uh, but my oh. older sisters, I mean, the eldest did architecture. I mean, so she, she was at uni in the sort of late 60s. So it was quite unusual. Mm-hmm. She did architecture. The second one did engineering, civil engineering, and the third one did medicine. Mm. So again, not a lot of women going around in those professions at that time. Mm. Do you think that had an influence on you? Because they were ground, they were groundbreaking. They were pretty groundbreaking. I think there was a lot of pressure for them. The el- my eldest sister is very much an artist and a painter, and um, I, and my dad uh, later on, because she did go back to painting after she had her three children and doing art classes, and he regretted making her go and do an academic subject. And he realised all she wanted to do was be a hippie artist. And she's, she's you know, I, it, I think it was very hard for her in that world. And it was similarly for my second sister, who's brilliant with needlework and creativity and cooking. And I think to be one of two women in the entire year of the civil engineering course in Kings, she, I think it was a struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I look at all three of my sisters and see very creative beings, but there was this big pressure my dad, my mum had come from an academic background. Her father was a prof of maths at Cambridge. And there was always this academic pressure, certainly coming from that side, and even mm-hmm. my father. So I think, naturally, I think if they'd been, they all had kids. We've all had children. We've all got married and had kids. But I think, naturally, there's a huge amount of creativity that I think, you know, I think we've got, I can see it with parents, they, they push their children to, to achieve academically and it almost switches something off. I've noticed teaching the cello and violin for many years, that you, there's this, I, I, I'm not pro grade exams, I, I know too many people have done all the grades and then they leave home and they never touch the instrument ever again and to me that's such a failure. 
that mm-hmm. it's almost like it's destroyed their love of music. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just feel that trying to make the arts, trying to examine them and test them and say you've got to paint a picture this way to pass your O-level art or whatever. Is, is oh my goodness, you just hit the absolute nail on the head, haven't you? Uh, and the same with music, you've got to play it this way. You can't put your expression in, you've got to do exactly the instructions on the page. And to me, it's, it's madness. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree because I completely stopped doing art after um, O level art because I was told you either do a copy of a David Hockney or you won't pass. I was like, but I don't paint like David Hockney, so how <laughs> so am I, I going to really do that? Want the system <laughs> to change? I, I feel, I even feel having a system that's the same all the seasons round is madness yeah. because. If we went with the seasons, we'd have shorter working days in the winter, longer working days in the summer. Yeah. We would hibernate a little bit and rest and restore through the winter. And then we would have a lot more energy in the spring and summer. And yeah, I do. I don't know whether you've heard of it. I run a Gold Arts Award. Mm-hmm. Um, I do mentoring and coaching at Eastbourne College for that. And that system is great because it just lets the end of it. There's no, there's no grading. It's just pass or fail. Um, you either do it or you don't do it. Yeah. And it's great. And we get some amazing outcomes. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah, I, I think, think that's great. To, I think even it'd be nice if we even got away from the pass or fail because mm. artists, I mean, if, if someone submitted something. The only way they'll fail is if they don't show us what they've done. Oh, fabulous. so the only failure yeah. is if you yeah. don't give if me some evidence, if you don't that. present me some evidence that you've done something. Yeah, yeah. no, I get that. Yes. And that's so good because. I think we've created also quite a competitive system. Mm. You know, people say, well, what grade did you get? Or what mark yeah. did you get? Or, you know, I've heard, I've heard mm. parents, I, I taught a very lovely girl who was very like, fairy-like, a bit of a natural on the cello, I knew a mum. Mm. And we did really well. And then she took her to a teacher that would put her through grades and mm. pushed her immediately into grade five cello. Mm. And then the mum was saying, came up to me and said, she nearly got a distinction. And I thought, you haven't told me about the music she played or what yeah. she did. All you're bothered about is the fact she got a merit, not a distinction, because you, mm. you won't. <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's, it's so the programming, sad. isn't it? It's, it is. I absolutely agree with you because, I mean, I had this very conversation with um, Charlie, my 15 year old this morning, because he's just literally gone back to do his GCSE year. And yeah. he said, oh. I'm not looking forward to it because they put us under so much pressure. Yeah. And I said, Charlie, they can only put you under pressure if you accept the pressure. True. If you decide not to be put under pressure, then they can't put you under pressure. And all the only pressure you'll get from me is to do your best so you're happy. Yes, it is. That's it all is, I want. Uh, you're right. We have to agree to do the pressure. Yeah, um, we have to agree to accept it. But a lot as well, I, I feel, going on to doing the homey, I did dentistry, I ended up being a special needs dentist, having done hospital jobs, and then I was always good with kids or people that were very anxious. Um, so I treated people with, you know, I became the phobic specialist, people would send them to me, um, because I could understand why. How did you go things. from, like, so you were learning the cello at school and then you went and then you took the medical path into dentistry? I Well, basically, I decided, so I, I, I started the cello at 10 and absolutely flew with it. Mm. Um, but uh, for A-levels, I took science and maths. Um, yeah, because Because I family. felt there was this pressure. And my, my teacher was in the Halle, which was the main professional orchestra in mm. In Manchester, I was, we used to go across mm. and have lessons with her in my when I was in the sixth form. And her, she painted the reality of being, I wanted to be a professional orchestral player at the time. Mm. And she painted the reality. And the reality is that you're on tour a lot. You're, you're, you're away from home a lot. Mm. It's very hard to have a fact. She didn't have, she wasn't married and didn't have children. But if you want, I always knew I wanted to be married and have children. So the reality she painted to me was, you know, lots of hours on a tour bus, lots of time away from home. A very, quite a tough environment, really. Mm. It, it can take the joy out of the music. And I, I've played with many professionally trained musicians over the years, and they've some of them have had such an awful time at music college as well. 
And I, I feel very lucky that I haven't had the joy of music knocked out of me in, in mm. a competitive world. So I think she very much painted a picture and said, look, if you can do something else, you do it and keep mm. music as your passion, mm. which is what I did. I decided being brought up by adopt parents um, and the on-call commitment and everything else and the and the trauma, it, I, you know, they didn't really counsel them for post-traumatic stress, which I think all doctors and health professionals probably need in those days. And I think a lot of that angst came out at home. Um, and, and it's quite often, you know, you know, I feel we got quite neglected, which is ironic that our parents were doctors. Mm. Um, so I chose dentistry for two reasons. One, my grandmother wanted me to go to Cambridge. And in a, going to a comprehensive in Sheffield, only the, the real weird top tier went to Cambridge, this sort of very eccentric, very straight A's, which in my day, straight A's was a very rare thing to get. Um, mm. And I wasn't in that tier. If I'd been at a private school, then I would have probably been in the Oxbridge tier. But in the state school, it was like, there's no way I'm Cambridge material. Mm. Um, so dentistry had two advantages at that time. One was it, I still got to do all the medical sciences at university. Um, it didn't have an on-call commitment at the time. It did later on. I did end up doing on-call, but that's another story. Um, and they didn't do dentistry at Cambridge. So I couldn't upset my grandmother. <laughs> I, couldn't I can't go, to... go there. <laughs> they don't do dentistry. Sorry. Yeah. 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 So um, it, it sort of got me out of a couple of little trickinesses. Mm. Um, so I went to King's to do dentistry and kept music mm. as, a, as, a, as a hobby. Uh, mm. But meanwhile, my mum was ill the year I went to university and died the year before I graduated. Uh, with um, it, she was diagnosed with something called glioma, but uh, with hindsight, I think she was a she accepted a consultant's in a consultant in an A and E in casualty job when I was fifteen, and I was thinking, well, um, she still had five of us at home, five sort of youngsters ranging from ten to sixteen, um, a big house to run. She was very much into her music. She played the flute, ran an orchestra. She grew a lot of veg. She decorated the house. She And she took on this full-time consultancy post and was going through the menopause. And the menopause, I think, is a time to become wise, to stop and mm. take a sabbatical. The midlife. It's the midlife. Take time to reflect and, and learn. And she did the exact opposite, really, when I consider it. She took on a demanding job the other side of, of a large city in a very busy a &E department on top of having five children still at home and three stepchildren having grandchildren to, coming to stay a lot and still I mean I don't know how she did it I, I think horrible. but she ended up having lots of gynecological problems uh, having a couple of major ops and finally having a full hysterectomy Going back to it way too quickly, I don't think she was on any hormone supplementation. And there's now evidence that if you've got no estrogen and progesterone in your system, that your brain starts to, you start mm. to lose brain structure. Mm. Um, and she was diagnosed with glioma, but I'm starting to wonder if it was actually the fact she didn't start to, you know, in your 50s, it's a time to start to slow down, to start to just decide which are two or three things that are really important for you to do, not be spreading yourself thin. And I, I now think, being the age she was that she died, I think, I think it was the menopause. I think she. It, it sounds like she lived a hundred years. It sounds in like 50. she lived. <laughs> I think she lived multiple lives in one. Yeah. Fundamentally. I mean, yeah. obviously her dying when I was 21 had a massive impact on my I life. And going yeah. to uni, having this very sick mum, and I just spent my life on the train going back to Sheffield yeah. to try and help. Yeah. Um, because I couldn't really... I, I'm not a party girl anyway. I'm more of a... I think a lot of creatives are quite quiet. I don't know. Am I wrong there? I No, no. I, yeah, you know, we're quite isolated. Um, we like our own company. And, to, yes, yeah. to create, you need your own time. Don't you, you need to, to know. It's that Brené Brown and Maya Angelou thing, isn't it? It's about I belong to everyone and no one. Yeah. You know, and, and I belong it, everywhere and nowhere. Yeah. And that's a creative thing, isn't it? It's because that's, it's like you're giving something to everyone 
but actually you belong to no one because you just belong to yourself. Quite. And I, I think people who aren't, who have different roles in their lives, maybe don't always appreciate that. I went to a lovely little concert, two young guys playing harp and cello on a Saturday. And it was delightful. Mm. I was talking to another friend who's a musician. She said, people don't realise how many hours mm. of rehearsal and refinement that has taken to produce mm. that programme of music. Mm. And it's the same with a with a wonderful painting, isn't it, as well? Same within the whole creative arts. People don't appreciate that it's not just what you see before you. It's the journey. It's the process. It's, it's, it's the life. And it's the layers. I think my music yeah. has become more and more enriched the more I've done the hours. But uh, mm. So I don't have to think about how to play anymore. I just play. Mm. But I can put lots in. I can un make unravel the story of the music and... I'm very lucky mm. to have found a violinist that I really connect with. So we've got mm. this duo called Reflections. And, mm. uh, Which is how I got to know you, wasn't it? Because you came along to one of our exhibitions, the lovely Edith Paul Barton, friend of. Yeah. And, and then we started chatting. And then we had that lovely coffee where we chatted all about what you were doing. And yeah. I was just absolutely intrigued because you've been on a very interesting journey. And, and you have a very interesting background that is... It's almost counterintuitive, as I say, because you come from this big family, which you would think would naturally prerequisite someone to be very outgoing and able to cope in crowds and be very um, confident. And yet you're not that person. You are no. very... And I think I've managed to do a facade of that. Probably. Oh, yes, haven't we all? <laughs> For many years. I think, I think I felt almost the quiet creative that's happy on her own and a mm. bit of a homebod. I almost had that as boring, and mm. but also I think, which is not. I absolutely no, absolutely not. It's not. No. But having children, I think there's such. I felt there was such pressure as well. It's interesting as a dentist, which again is years in the training and years in the refining, and it's an art form in itself, restoring mm. the mouth and the teeth, particularly working around connecting to the person and putting them at their ease. I mean, that's another, to me, it's a huge creation. Yes, because there is an extreme anxiety in most of the population around dentists, aren't there? <laughs> Unlike doctors who do much worse things to you. I know, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, but there's um, an extreme anxiety. So when did you, so you've, you've done the cello and that's been your passion, but you're going to leave that and you go to dentistry and you learn and you do the dentistry. When was the kind of the epiphany? The moment when you realised that this was all connected and you could like move forward more in a holistic manner and well, pick things. It's been, the cello has always been there. So I'd come back from a stressful day of dentistry mm. and I'd be able to just sit and play the cello. My husband at the time used to go away a lot to he liked following the rugby matches and he was in a male voice choir so I had a lot of time on my own and I was always studying trying to discover more about health but mm. the music has always kept me healthy in my own sort of way I think just being able to come home and play the cello and now I've got a harp that I find very relaxing to play as well that's my lockdown project learning the harp but um I don't think there was a moment. I th well, there are moments along the way. I think having children for me was an absolute epiphany because mm. something just clicked. I think from all that education and which I felt switched off a lot of my natural instincts about my body and my health. But I think being pregnant and giving birth and having a baby for me that absolutely switched something on that had got shut down. I mean, I think the other thing in this culture, certainly in my upbringing, there was no real understanding or, ex or, trend or I, I would think this, you know, in our ancient culture, we would celebrate puberty. We would celebrate coming of age. We would educate our youngsters in healthy practice um, when those things started. It, when, when unions were made, there would be, again, the elders would educate and there would be classes, and in some religions and cultures there still are when a couple choose to come together. But I didn't feel that was there in my day. There was it, there was no support when my period started. I just Isn't remember. that amazing? With eight, you know, there's eight of you, well, plus two doctor parents. I packed a package of sanitary towels up and told me not to make a fuss. That was it. 
There were some scary films at school trying to put you off teenage pregnancy. Oh, yeah, I remember those. <laughs> um, or, and smoking. But, yeah. You know, honouring these life transitions, and that's, that's something I really hope that we can bring back is is just honouring these life transitions mm. within families, within communities, mm. where it, you know it's honoured. That you're Did now you a woman. see there was some research recently? Because that's just triggered that off in my brain. Um, because I think that's come about because we've lost that extended family kind of vibe, haven't we? You know, where grannies and, and aunties are all omnipresent. And there was some yeah. recent research about the failure of the nuclear family. Yeah. This whole concept We're of not two, meant to live in isolation. Two point, oh. you know, two parents and 2.1 yeah. children and how absolutely devastating that has been culturally for us. As and in, lockdown as, really mm. devastated. I mean, for me, mm. just to be in lockdown with my lovely husband was with his work and his stress of work in the mm. house and no one else to decant that onto. I mean, mm. I ended up fracturing my hip last mm. October. Mm. And I think um, I think it's it, it, it's been a menopause process again mm. that, I mean, certain people now are really trying to get it out there. Davina McCall, whether you love... Mm. Or like her or, what, or whatever I think what she's doing is fantastic she's really uh, there's a lot of people now trying to shout from the rooftops as women we must talk about these things we must talk to our daughters about periods and puberty and and we must support our youngsters when they in their relationships and their mm-hmm. commitments to one another and and through having children and then prepare for the menopause there's some wonderful books my dear partner's in her 40s so mm-hmm. more perimenopause and she's there's I think Maisie Hill's written a couple of books one's called period power one's called one there's another one about the perimenopause and I think we really have to be starting to address the menopause in our 40s I, I think as well not just women but men and men need to slow down too there is a I menopause. don't I think there's a menopause there is and I think it's understanding the phases of our lives mm-hmm. And once you're in your fifth, we're in your fifties. We're in our autumn years, and it's hopefully we put everything in place for our autumn and winter years to yeah. just think: What am I really passionate about here? I, I know, I feel like with our education system, we end up jacks of all trades, master of none. It tries to spread you across so many subjects instead of. It's the old thing: if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely you know, that that that, uh, that yeah. just reminded me of when you were saying about um you've you've really mastered wearing the mask the fish mask to climb the tree and being I somebody being, people thought i was this outgoing so yeah. i never really had time for my own music now moving to a new area i mean i was in demand a lot to play in orchestras and choral societies i ran an orchestra i did lots of chamber music i was doing teaching I was juggling children I was doing my homeopathy somewhere in that as well and my Mm. mindfulness stuff but I was just spread so thin when I look back on it you know I'd gone Mm. through a divorce I was being a single parent at one point um and I, I literally we my husband and I got here moved away from the raids because he's got two and I've got three so we've got five uh, they're all in their well they're about to start hitting their 30s now which is a bit interesting (laughs) But, you know, I think we he's still working full time, but I think there's that fear of letting go of his work, but we won't go there to stuff. But we got here and we both collapsed in a great big heap, essentially. We've both gone through a divorce. We've both, you know. And was that at the beginning of the pandemic when you arrived no, we there? we moved here in 2018. Okay. Uh, so, so March just 2018, before. we moved here. We had three uni graduations for one reason and another, our eldest um, had done medicine after doing various other things so she's nearly 30 this is Andrew's daughter uh, and then his son and my daughter were the same year both had taken a year out so they it just worked out that three of them graduated that's that summer wow. that we moved to Sussex from Cambridgeshire mm-hmm. so and they all wanted us obviously there so we were mm-hmm. traipsing doing that we we had various things to do in the house we had to replaster all the ceilings and various things as and you do we'd with get these married <laughs> oh you could decide to get and married, we married as well. <laughs> but we, we literally did a very small thing we didn't have our we did something for our children separately we literally decided just to do a very small because we've both been married it's like three weddings and a funeral became three graduations, three graduations and a wedding, and a wedding <laughs> yes. 
And then um, there's a film there, Felicity. <laughs> three graduations, a wedding, and he got made redundant. Oh, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Not ideal no, timing. He was like, oh. Uh, that was in the November. So, yeah, the graduations in the summer, we got wed- married in the September. We literally turned it around in six weeks. Um, wow. wow. And um, we, a very small affair. Um, mm. And then he got made redundant. And then I, I was struggling. I, my energy crashed moving here. I just, I think mm. it was just the busyness of the last 30 years. You know, helping care for my mum, even as a student, I didn't exactly do carefree student. And dentistry mm. is quite a full-on course as well. And straight mm. into, you know, I, I, I look back and I think, you know, suddenly you graduate as a dentist or a doctor and you're suddenly on your own on calling casualty. I mean, I did oral surgery which in mm. Kings, which was... Head, head and neck trauma I won't mm. even go what that was about but no please don't suddenly, uh, <laughs> I'm already suddenly, anxious enough going to the dentist but suddenly as a 23 year old you know I'm on call on a Friday isn't that night bizarre? on my own isn't that bizarre so you're 23 and you're in there dealing with people with you know trauma from accidents and stuff yeah I mean they don't there's no way they would do that now you've got uh the the medics uh, usually do have more senior backup, but mm. in the oral surgery team, we were basically the juniors. The house officers were dentists, just newly qualified dentists, and you didn't. We didn't have in in house on call. We had to call them from home if we needed backup. Mm. Um, wow, that's huge, isn't it? At twenty three, no wonder by the time you hit, you know, coming up to fifty, you were just like, I'm done here. I, I, I need a break. I think that's what happened. And you got a literal break. I, I literally did have a break. <laughs> you literally I, I a love break. metaphysical. I love <laughs> meaning of symptoms. I mean, hips are about moving forwards in your life. Um, so I was 54 when I moved here. And I literally, I think, I literally ground to a halt, which mm. is hardly surprising when you look no, at my history. exactly. You know, because exactly. I was also helping look after younger siblings, cooking food. As a, I, I think I ended up being a child carer. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I think I was working from about eight yeah you know cooking helping with the cleaning and cooking and looking after younger siblings and I was the that's what we did back then that's what we did back then thank goodness that isn't what happens now because it isn't but I think to leave a young (laughs) newly qualified dentist or doctor responsible I I mean I won't even tell you the sort of stuff I was being faced with because it might be a bit shocking and I look yeah don't please don't that we really in a lot of cultures, medicine is a postgraduate degree. Mm-hmm. In our ancient wisdom, you know, you you would be an acolyte. You'd be a trainee possibly all your life. You might mm-hmm. never be a person, a, a chief medicine person, you know. And I, I, I just wonder if, if health should be much more like this again, where we've got the wise elders who, who've got the life experience who train the youngsters and then you're voted by the community to become whether you be, ever become a fully fledged doctor or not mm. um but i wonder of- whether that's because of the way we the nhs came about after the war and and the structure that came about with it and we've just i think the nhs is a on. bit of a white elephant i mean i have to say broke an absolute hip. treasure uh, you know i broke my hip and i was pinned back together the next day Mm, an absolute treasure we don't want to not have it but in some cultures you know I have to take my hat off to that aspect of it the other aspect of it is it's it's a there's something that needs to shift um Mm. when I did my I did a master's in dental public health which was statistics and epidemiology but also learning about different approaches and models of healthcare. And I remember being taught, 30 years ago, being taught about the social model of health and the medical model of health. Mm. And in those days, they basically said, well, in rich countries, we have the medical model, which is the high tech, expensive drugs, you know, you've got these modern hospitals with all Mm. this state of the art equipment. um, and, And so in rich countries, you can do the medical model. In poor countries where they haven't got the money for that sort of infrastructure, we it's more the social model of health. I mean, we use a, a mixture, but in, in rich countries, it's mainly the medical model, which is high tech, operations, drugs. Um, you don't need to take responsibility for your own health, darling. We'll let everyone else do it sort of mm. approach. The social model is much more about educating people to look after themselves. It's about training people to go around to the villages to help educate on health and help give people tools to treat themselves. Mm. And I remember sitting back thinking, 
think I might be better moving to a poorer country. Yeah, maybe <laughs> India's for me now. Yeah, you know, because I'm, and in India, they're of course much they more. They have aware a really of social life and death. I mean, mm. in this culture, death is apparently the enemy. Mm. So the medical model tries to keep everybody alive. Yeah. And being on a ward, an orthopedic ward back in October, I've never been in hospital. I had my babies at home. I was, I've always been mm. this natural health. Um, so to be in hospital and pumped full of drugs when I don't do drugs, um, mm. and they never, I wasn't weighed, and I'm not the largest of women. So mm. I was off the planet. It's taken me quite a long time to detox the drugs. Mm. Um, but... I was an absolute juvenile on that ward. The ward was, there was a woman 95 in, you know, she was demented, shouting morning, noon and night. Obviously oh. fractured something, which is why she was on the orthopedic yeah. ward. And they've now got a new speciality called gerio orthopedics, which is, now that may, they've got such, we've got such a large elderly population. I mm. think for the first time uh, in, 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 since records were taken or something, we've got, a higher population of over 60s than under fives. Wow. The population is very skewed now. We've got a much larger elderly population mm. because we're keeping people alive. And I'm not, mm. you know, and I, I think if you've got a quality of life, if, you, if, mm. you, if you've got, but when I see people in extreme suffering being kept alive, I, I'm struggling. Mm. I'm really mm. struggling. Mm. I think being wheeled off that ward and peering, well, peering into who was making all that noise in the room next mm. to me. Um, sad, just stressful. Like That's an sad and, and stressful to experience. It was, and sitting in... Yeah. Uh, so I, how did you get how did you get back to your cello and how did you find your collaborator after so, all of that? Um. I think for me, being a woman was is a gift when you have, for me, having children got me off the treadmill, mm. you know, because basically I qualified, then I was stuck into this nine to five and on call type work. So having my first child and moving to Cambridgeshire, so those gave me two changes of scene, mm. moved me away from, I'd been working for Greenwich Health Authority as a special needs dentist for um, a few years. Um, and moving to Cambridgeshire got me away from, I couldn't go back to that job, obviously, mm. um, and I'd got this baby. So I did salaried dental work. Um, and then it was at a toddler group. Um, a, a musician friend found out I, I had a cello sitting in a cupboard, and I literally got dragged to an orchestra. Um, so I'm very grateful to this friend, Sally, who, who, yeah, got me playing again. I mean, I was sort of playing a bit, but she got me out playing again. Mm. Um so I, I soon became known as a decent cellist. In, and in Cambridgeshire, there's a lot of work. Um, you know, a lot of areas is top pro or basic amateur. But Cambridgeshire is one of those magical areas where there's a lot of work for people in, in between tiers. Mm. Um, so before I knew it, I was getting paid to do play for choral society concerts. And um, I had two more children at, in Cambridgeshire and was doing bits of dentistry. But my middle son regressed into autism. He had enormous health problems and was in and out of hospital and the youngest they thought had cerebral palsy had a lot of lung problems so it became increasingly impossible to do dentistry you can't work from home um mm. you can't you know you've got an, and I was torn between you know I'd have a list of patients booked for the day and a, and a sick child and mm. I felt can't, just torn. can't do it uh, mm. and I couldn't do it because I felt so responsible for my patients and my children and but I thought my children have to come first mm. here really mm. my, I have to sort my own backyard out before mm. I sort anyone else so in a way um the health problems the children got me exploring complementary health and mindfulness and uh, I did some Reiki training and then I I did some learned kinesiology and allergy testing and I found the people I now do a lot of training with in Sussex and I, I signed up to do a train as a homeopath. Um, but in the meantime, uh, people were increasingly paying me to play and teach cello. Um, and the first lady that rang for lessons, I, I said, well, I don't teach. So, well, you've been recommended by about three or four. Yeah, I've been recommended by a few people. I went, oh, okay. <laughs> go. Luckily for me, she would not go away. So she became my first pupil, an adult lady who, who was hilarious. I always remember her surname was Mallard and I was trying to teach her to play the swan by <laughs> <laughs> and she'd 
she was doing she was pushing herself through grade six and uh, but she needed some basic techniques so she picked really quick pieces where slow pieces really slow up, show up bad if you've not got good technique yeah. and the swan of course has very long slow bows yada yada and you've got to be very smooth and flowy and she she couldn't do it really um, but, but she was a joy she was a very interesting woman and from that I increasingly got asked to teach and my children did music and the music service dragged me to cover if they needed help and I mm. ended up coaching cellos in the youth orchestra and in a quartet club and I love teaching connection through music. Mm. Uh, I did a ukulele mm. club and I did a I, I set up a bandistra at the local school so that the kids that weren't learning formal instruments could use the percussion stuff that was in the school cupboard. Yeah. I called it a bandistra. And yeah. We, and I, I got people trying to create their own music through all sorts of, I'd take in, like one day I, I took in all the, the Greek gods and they all had to choose a god and try and express that god through the music. And mm. I, I've had great, I've had great fun. Mm. Um, mm. And I think the key is not to see things as work, is to see that what I do is my passion. Yeah. Yes, it earns me some money to keep me afloat. Well, I'm lucky now, and money is... I, I, you know, I'm not worrying about paying bills so much. I, I yeah. do need to earn a bit in my own right to be able to buy clothes and do my mindfulness courses and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I, I feel secure now in my home. Mm. Mm. Um, I think the hip fracture made me realise I was trying to still work very hard doing stuff I wasn't really meant to be doing. But as mm. long as my work is my love and my joy and my passion that will come out and yeah. I'm better not being too structured so I'm happy to come and play for a function or do I, I don't want to do nine to five thing I think that's a creative thing it was that realization that I explored in a last my last session with my coach that I see and um, the psychics have said I didn't want to work and I thought well, I, I do want to work but what I didn't what as a creative, I don't do is if I get caught, right, I've got to do a lesson every Monday at 4.15. I, so I've now got pupils that really want to as and when. Yeah. And I can then go and play in my duo or the harp. I did a wedding with the harp the other day. And it's just an as and a when. And I focus on the event. So if I've got an event coming up that I'm doing some music, um, my duo partner and I get together every two weeks for so we're literally learning there's so much beautiful violin cello music and mm -hmm. uh, that we're just really getting it taped so we've now so we've got a sort of whole range of stuff we can play that we've rehearsed and, and we've got tape. I think that creative life is very much that event structure isn't it it's yeah. the event structure we all love because we're creatives and we don't want to be put in a box and told we have to do this every day is we like the event thing where you know you're working towards a solo show or you're working towards a performance or you're working towards yeah. a completion of a body of work and then it's done yeah and then you can do something different and so you don't get stuck in yeah. a rut I absolutely see that so often with yeah. working with creatives that if you say to them well you should do one day a week in admin and you should do four hours a day on yeah, social media nothing is going to happen but if you say you've got the whole month and you've got this episode happening here they're motivated and they'll do it and then you don't know and you can do something different the following yeah. month I think and they're very motivated then I realize as a dentist I end up being a special needs because I am creative so a lot of dentistry is you do it this way, but mouths and people are all so different. So there needs to be a connection to the person's energy. There needs to be, um, certainly restoring tooth morphology is very creative. It's very fine mm. detail work and you have to be quite artistic and have mm. good manual dexterity. Um, but I ended up very much in special needs where each person had to have a specialised approach. Yeah. I, I got the reputation in Cambridge again for being the, the music teacher that was out the box that if someone was going to give up and they weren't doing very well with the teacher who just drove the grades they'd say oh why don't we send you to Felicity yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because Felicity would make lessons fun Felicity would yeah. try and bring out what was within Felicity would try and you know my thing is to try and connect to what that person wants to do what that child not what the parent wants to do if it's a yeah. child uh, but often by the time they came to me the parents were well the child's going to give up 
if you don't find yeah. someone who's got a different approach. Yeah. So by the time they got to me, generally, um, most of them were accepting that if they wanted the child to actually enjoy and carry on with the instrument. They needed somebody yeah. who had a different approach. Um, so I think that creativity is always expressed through whether it's the dentistry or the music. And it's, t- and it's taken me a long time. Now, I, 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 I used to say to parents, I'm, I'm not a, I, my teaching is not grade-based. If you want that, I'm not the right teacher. I teach, mm. um, I, I want them just to, to be themselves and express themselves through the instrument. Mm. I'm not going to tell them what to do. I'll give them help with the technique and how mm. to understand the music and how to read music and all of that. But at the end of the day, I want to see what their music is. Otherwise, you're just getting cookie cutter, aren't you? You're just getting, and as you said, you know, the the education system is already aligned to making shoving out loads and loads of the same thing. What, well, even the timetable, you've got an hour here, an hour there. You know, you know, yeah. as a creative, you might need to sit and play for hours before you. Why is it then that in industry they constantly talk about USP? What's your unique selling point? Ugh. What, what is that all about? I it's like we're going to defining its limit. I think yeah, it's we're like wrong. pushing them out, and then they have to have this thing. And you know, I'm I'm with you. Connect to source. Just connect back to source. It is. I mean, uh, I I've been going to a lovely yoga teacher since I moved here. She's she's the same age as our eldest daughter. I mean, she's about to be 30 I think she's about to have second child and we were talking as she's such a wise old soul and we were talking about children young children are still connected to source they are they have the most wisdom yeah the kids <laughs> and then it gets knocked out <laughs> and I've spent a lot of time trying to yeah I've spent a lot of time trying to put that source knowledge back into my children so that they can make the decisions for themselves I won't make like you say when you're teaching and like I do when I'm mentoring and coaching I'm not going to tell you how to do it or what to do I will give you the benefit of my experience and then you choose exactly I mean uh, uh, I've got a few teenagers that I that come for lessons now and and Mm. a couple of adults and I and particularly with I've had a couple of people in the sixth form who are off to uni one's just gone mm. off and I, I just say I'm just giving you the tools to be able to if you want to learn to play a piece of music you can put it on the stand and I'm just giving you the tools to how to work out how to play it how to work out the tricky pieces and mm-hmm. slow them down and work them out and, I, and and give her the technique and give her the tools to be able to then apply that to anything she wants to play exactly. in her life. Not because just, if you don't do that, all you're doing is holding everyone in a place of pain. Because every time they want and to do something else, they have to come back to you. Well, it, it I, and I, I don't it, agree with that. I discovered that when I trained as a homeopath, actually, and you know, we we had a chiropractor in the town where I was living, and she very much tied people. Her business model was everyone had to come back once a month for treatment. So mm. it wasn't in her interest to actually get people well. Yeah, no, and I just back. and. As a homeopath, that's I would, a capitalist business model which doesn't sit with a homeopath. No, so um, you know my approach was to get people to get themselves a first aid kit, and I would teach them how to use the kit for themselves. Mm. I would I would teach them about how to use homeopath, homeopathy for themselves. So at least they had. You know, I'd start off with just some first aid type remedies. So they understood it for themselves. It wasn't about me. I mean, yes, I could help them through whatever issues they were bringing. But for me, success, and I love in, in traditional Chinese medicine, you only got paid if your patients were well. That should be, isn't it? Um, and I've occasionally done that with occasionals. I've said, pay me if it works. Mm. You know, I had a, a girl... Uh, I used to get a lot of work just through parents at the school and knew mm. I was a homeopath and there'd be often little white pills at the school gate. And yeah. Saying, <laughs> it's going to look, look really dodgy. <laughs> but as a kid, um, I knew the, the mum quite well and she had torticollis. So she, <laughs> she, and she was stuck. She'd been stuck mm. like it for some time. And she was getting, the, the medical profession were putting her on diazepam and and wanting to put her through a scanner and and this poor child was getting more and more wound up as you can so understand. more tight and more rigid uh, and more stuck and, and what colis is weird because you literally wake up <laughs> mm. and um it was just the, the, 
great remedy for fear and and mm. uh, extreme fear is aconite. It's one mm. of our absolute standards, aconite. Mm. And I, I just I, I douse mm. or use kinesiology. You can muscle test using your mm. fingers, or I, I swing anything weighted. I haven't got anything weighted, so mm. I douse. So I just doused what she needed and made it up for her. I have a remedy machine. And and I basically said to mum, well, if it works, pay me then. And it worked, yeah. so I got paid. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's putting the focus. You know, we pay our doctors, our, we pay doctors a lot of money, but mm. they're, they're, they're trained to just try and put a sticky patch on things. You, mm. you try and suppress the symptom. The symptom's the messenger, of course. Mm. Uh, they're not really mm. trained to go deeper. Um, mm. Or even, you know, they're not overly happy, I notice, if you take self-responsibility. Um, well, as you said at the very beginning, because we live within a medical system, not a social system. So that's their, that's their role. That, and that's, that's their how role we've been in the conditioned, and mm. we've been conditioned as a culture to go to the doctor mm. and not to necessarily take responsibility. I mean, it, mm. it took it took nearly losing a child for me to think I've got to walk away a bit from this. Mm. And for a long time, I was very angry with the conventional medical system. I was angry mm. about how neglectful my parents were, but I realised they were quite traumatised by what they were having to work mm. in now. Mm. Um, so. Do you find when you pick up your musical, when you pick up your cello or whatever, that you can work through that? You lose yourself. I think that's why it's so important. I think it's like painters to own, you know, anger, own, own emotions, not Mm. try and pretend they're not there. I think the root of things like cancer is just pushing resentment in. Mm, Absolutely. Dare we frozen screen? Hopefully frozen screen's gonna stop in a minute. We seem to have lost Felicity. (laughs) She might come back in a second. Let's see what happens. Sometimes this is because there's a power cut at the other end. I might have to wrap this up without Felicity being present and say thank you all so much and um, thank you for listening it's been absolutely fascinating talking to Felicity such an incredible background and um, listening to all her her life experiences and I will be back with um, another yeah she's definitely gone so I should think she's had a power cut Um, I will be back with another one of my pure talks soon take care now bye